به برنامه اینا نگال سر خوش اومدید سلام به همگی من مریم نمازی هم و من فرید بوز پویا هستم در برنامه این هفته در مورد حمله تروریستی در لندن صحبت خواهیم کرد فتوای احمقانمون در رابطه با اینه که کسی دیگه به فتوای احمقانه گوش نمیده به خاطر خیلی مسخره شو میکنن فکر میکنین معلومه و لحظه زیبای زندگیمون در رابطه با موتور سواری زنان در ایرانه مصاحبه این هفته بخشی از صحبت های مریم که من فکر کنم سخنرانی خیلی خوبیه اگه ممنون. این مسئله رو من بگم اعتراض نکنید در کنفرانس زنان و سکلاریز که مرکز تحقیقات در واشنگتن دی سی برگزار کرده بود امیدواریم از این برنامه خوشتون بیاد جای نرید با ما باشید چند روز پیش در لندن یه حمله تروریستی بود جلوی پارلمان انگلیس و چهار نفر کشته شدن و خب اولین چیزی که آدم فکر میکنه در چنین مواقعی اینه که کسایی هستن عزیزانی هستن که دیگه نتونستن برگردن خونش خونشون دیگه نمیتونن همدیگه رو در آغوش هم بگیرن و دیگه نیستن بین ما و خب یه واقعیت دیگه هم اما اینه که این اتفاقی که تو لندن افتاد اینه که اتفاقی که هر روز داره تو خاورمیانه و شمال آفریقا صورت میگیره 50 درصد بیشتر آدما دارن کشته میشن توی پاکستان و افغانستان و غیره تا توی اروپا و اینم نباید فراموش کرد که این یه مسئله و حمله بین المللی علیه بشر و حقیقت اینه که مردم و کسایی که هر روز از جنات اسلام دست راستی اسلام سیاسی اسلامیون دارن ضربه میخورن تو ایران تو سوریه تو عراق توی پاکستان تو افغانستان و شمال آفریقا ابرا احساس همدردیشون با مردم تو لندن رو حس میکنن و این یه همبستگی بینالمللی همونطوری که مشکل مشکل بینالمللیه همبستگیش هم همبستگی بینالمللی و همه احساس میکنن که حمله میشه به یه نفر توی پل پار... مقابل پارلمان بغل پارلمان یا توی پارلمان اون همون دقیقا همون حمله یه که داعش جمهوری اسلامی حزب الله یا طالبان غیره هر روز دارن سر مردم میارن و این هم بسته گفت کنم اهمیت داره وحس کردن مردم به هم در این مورد و اون ابراز بیان همدردی به نظر من خیلی هم. و یه چیز دیگه هم اینه که وقتی نگاه میکنیم به کسایی که کشته میشن یا مجروح میشن نه فقط در لندن و هر کجا واقعا از ملیت های مختلف هن از مذاهب مختلف هن یا بدون مذهب هن. و میشه دید که چقدر این مسئله مسئله که تمام مردم دنیا رو داره روش تاثیر میذاره تاثیر منفی واقعا داره روی خیلی ها میذاره و خب مقابله باهاش هم یه چیزی که باید بین المللی باشه یه سری آدم ها هستن که میگن که این تقصیر مهاجرینه ولی واقعیتش اینه که اینطوری نیست خود انگلیس چیز MI5 انگلیس میگه که سه هزار تا افراتیگرا هستن توی خود انگلیس مشخصه که مشکل اونان نه کسایی که یا مسلمونن یا اینکه از پیشینه ای از ایران و پاکستان و اینا میان این خیلی واضح است این شبکه های سه هزار نفره و یه جمع بزرگتر رو ایناست که باید مورد هدف پلیس و دستگاه های امنیتی باشه که بتونن جلوشون رو بگیرن که این کارا نکنن و ما هر روز روبرو هستیم با این جنات دستراسی کسایی که در واقع وصلا به جنات اسلامی تو دانشگاه ها هستن تو مجامع هستن توی سازمان ها سازمان یافته هستن و در واقع باید با اینا مقابل کرد هم از لحاظ سیاسی هم از لحاظ اجتماعی اینا باید ایزوله بشن و در واقع جامعه باید پاسخ اینا رو بده و خوراک تبلیغاتی هم براشون در این حال فراهم نکنه وقتی به خود این حمله تروریستی علیه مردم لندن نگاه میکنیم مسعود خالید کسی بوده که این کارو انجام داده خودش مثلا توی انگلیس به دنیا اومده و از خانواده مسلمان مثلا اصلا نمی اومده میخوام بگم که اینطوری وقتی که تمرکز باشه فقط روی مردم مسلمون یا مهاجرین این واقعیت دیده نمیشه که این یک کار کسایی که طرفدار و حامی اسلام سیاسی هم. یه, یه, یه جنبش سیاسی و خیلی جالبه اون بیانی رو که توی بعضی وقت توی جوامع اروپایی حاکم میشه یا بعضی وقت هست این وجود داره به شکل قوی اینی که مسئله مسئله پناهندگان یا مسئله خارجی است در واقع اصلا به این شکل نیست 
به در واقع این بیانی هم که وجود داره شما میبینید که سعی میکنن به جنگ چیز وست کنن به جنگ تمدن ها وست کنن این حقیقت نداره جنرات راست و اسلامی همشون سعی میکنن که از یک وضعیت پاشیده جامعه استفاده بکنن بیان پاشیدگی جامعه یکی از ابزارهای جنرات اسلامی و جنرات راستی که بعد با این مقابله کرد در این حال یه نکته دیگه هم هست اینه که توی روزنامه یه دلی تلگراف نوشته بودن که این از یه بار توی دهکده ای که توی منطقه کنت زندگی می کرده یه کسی اومده بهش گفته که تبیز نجادی یه دعوای تبیز نجادی داشته و این از ریل خارجش کرده و رفته این به جنات اسلامی پیوسته اینطوری نیست خیلی آدم هستن که با نجات پرستی و راسیز رو برو میشن ولی میرن به جنبش های زد فاشیست جنبش های زد نجات پرستی می و می جنگن اما هم بیکار میشه فقر با فقر رو برو میکنه نمیره به جنات هیتلری و فاشیست بپیانه میره به اتحادیه و سازمان میده برای زندگی بهتر این دو تا بیان متفاوت دو جامعه است که جامعه با جنات اسلامی جنات راست رو در واقع ایزوله بکنه و اون بیان انسانین رو در واقع پشتیبانی کنه نجات جامعه فقط از این طریقه در کنفرانس سکولاریسم و زنان در واشنگتن دی سی چند وقت پیش من سخنرانی داشتم در رابطه با مقاومت زنان علیه حجاب و علیه اسلام سیاسی و میخوایم سخنرانی خوبی هم هست میدونم که خیلی ممنون شما مرسی. خود اینجا نشستی ما این خجالت آوره <تصفيق> من فکر می‌کنم سخنرانی خیلی خوبیه و خیلی ممنون خیلی جالبه توش هست می‌خواستیم یه کلیپی از اون سخنرانی رو بهتون نشون بدیم و واقعیتش اینه که خب بالاخره مسئله حجاب خب به خصوص مردم ایران زنان ایران خوب اینو میدونن یک مسئله واقعا حیاتی و عمده است در مقابله با اسلام سیاسی آره نه تنها اهمیت داره ولی موضوعی که به طور مرتب شبان روز از تمام امکانات و مراجع و جمهوری اسلامی و دولت و اوباش اسلامی تلاش میکنن اینو به طور مرتب دارن روی مردم ایران میکوبند میارن مجبور میکنن مردم رو و این موضوعیه که نمیشه از کنارش راحت گذشت نمیشه فقط گفت که خب هر چند وقت یه بار یه سری اعتراض میکنن یک مسئله یه روزمره یه که مردم و اکثریت من 99 درصد مردم ایران با این قضیه و حجاب اجباری و دیدگاه اسلام نسبت به زن رو به رو هستن و باش سینه به سینه میشن و خود این اسلامی هم خوب میدونن علی خامنه اخیرا گفته که فمینیز یک طرح زیونیسته و اینکه اگر و طرحی که میخواد جامعه رو از بین ببره بپاشونه و یه واقعیت اینه که اگر حجاب دیگه نتونه تحمیل بشه روی مردم ایران واقعیتش اینه که جمهوری اسلامی رو میپاشونه از بین میبره و به همین دلیل انقدر ازش میترسن از برابری زن و مرد دقیقا به همیشه باید اینو بحث کنن به یک توطعه خارجی و میدونیم که توطعه خارجی تو جمهوری اسلامی یا آمریکاست یا دولت اسرائیل و سهونیزمه و اینا هر کسی رو که باش مخالفن یا میچسبونن به آمریکا یا میچسبونن به سهونیزم و این در واقع نشون میده که بس کردن حجاب هم به سهانیزم از سر ناچاریشون دیگه نمیتونن قبول کنن که مسئله هجاب و مخالفت بر علیه هجاب از خود جا جامعه ایران قلیان میزنه هر صحنه هر لحظه هر ثانیه و هر روزه این وضعیتی که ما باش روبرو هستیم دقیقا حالا با ما باشید و این کلیپ یه بخشی از سخنانی من رو نگاه کنیم با هم امیدوارم ازش خوشتون بیاد با ما باشید When I was 12 years old, obviously, I liked ABBA and Snoopy very much. Um, the, the Hezbollah came to my school, and it's, it's a generic word we use for those who do God's dirty work. You know, they belong to the party of God. And they came in order to segregate the boys from the girls in the playground, so they were standing there to make sure we don't mix, because it was a mixed school, and the schools hadn't been Islamicized yet. And of course, what we did was just run circles around them. We'd run into the boys' section, and the boys would run into ours. But it's just one example of just the obsession of Islamists with controlling the female body and preventing mixing that is deemed to be religiously impermissible. 
it's funny how they always tell us when we speak about the veil or gender mixing how there are so many more important things in the world, but they spend an awful lot of time trying to control veiling and gender mixing. It's ironic. So even at 12, they viewed girls as sources of fitna or chaos in society. And this applies even to younger children. Uh, this is a great example. This is of a uh, musical ensemble in Iran. It's called the Parisian Ensemble. And they had to go through several photographs before the censors accepted them. This was the first photo uh, of the ensemble which was rejected because the girls are not veiled, though they don't need to be veiled until the age of nine or until they reach puberty. Um, so this is the second photo where, of course, the girls have now been veiled, but it still wasn't acceptable to the censors. They thought the girls' arms were visible and it needed to change. And this is the final photo where the girls have put, been put in the back and their arms and hairs have been covered. So it, it applies to younger children and it rots and seeps into everything. Uh, just to give you an example, in 2013, the Iranian regime passed a law in its majlis, or Islamic assembly, which said that fathers could marry their adopted daughters. And the reason behind this was because they said when the girl reaches uh, her puberty, because she's not really their daughter, th there, there could be sexual tension between the, the stepfather and the adopted daughter. And therefore, it's best that the father marry her. And then she doesn't need to wear a veil and there doesn't need to be gender segregation. So just rots and seeps into everything. The, the veil and the segregation that follows it is, is really central to the Islamist project. And their aim is to completely erase women from the public space and girls. And of course, as Islamists, I mean people who are part of a political far-right movement trying to impose theocracies, Sharia law, similar in fundamentals to the Christian right, the Buddhist right, the Hindu right, and the Jewish right. There's an artist, his name is Philip uh, Toledano, and he's done a series on Iranian censorship of women, calling it portraits of absence. And it shows how regular items that are on sale in the shops are where women are on their covers, there are black markers used to completely erase them from the packaging. And you see this on magazines and adverts. Uh, here's another one where the woman's been completely blacked out. And when you look at these photos, I think what it, it tells you is that the chador or the borqa and the niqab are really the fabric version of this black marker, erased, devoid of humanity, disappeared. I often compare women to the disappeared of Argentina or the disappeared of the uh, 1980s in the Iranian regime where m countless political prisoners were massacred, buried in mass graves, and, and still you know, no one knows where they are. But this disappeared is based on gender, not political opinion and belief. And despite all the rules that they've imposed, it's never still enough for them. Every day, the fatwa factories across the world issue more rules and more restrictions for women and girls. Uh, we have a TV po program called Bread and Roses. It's uh, beamed into Iran using illegal satellite dishes. And the Iranian regime has labeled us immoral and corrupt. So it's definitely something you should be watching. Um, and in this uh, program, we have a segment called Insane Fatwa. And we have found a correlation between uh, you know, the, the most stupidest fatwa versus the imam with the longest and most stupidest name. And there's definitely some scientific research that needs to be done into this, but I'm, I'm gonna stand by it, despite the fact that there hasn't been evidence. So, you know, the, these rules, don't bring attention to yourself. Don't wear perfume, don't walk in the middle of the road. Don't uh, wear jeans, don't show your ankles or your hair. Don't cycle, don't drive. Don't laugh out loud, don't sing. Don't slap your thighs. We do a lot of sli uh, thigh slapping on bread and roses just to annoy them. <laughs> um, don't go to football matches because really the only reason you're going there in the first place is to glare at the men's thighs, the footballers' thighs. And don't eat cucumbers and bananas. I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that up to your own imagination. <laughs> so, 
you, you know, it's a well-oiled propaganda machinery that warns you against any transgressions. Here's a couple of uh, billboards in Iran and, and other places, Afghanistan, for example. Now, this is a baby, for goodness sakes, and it says, our children are protected via hijab. And this one says, if uh, no one wants to eat the leftovers of flies, uh, and if you don't want to be that, then you need to be properly veiled. So there's this constant barrage of messages saying you're loose if you're not veiled. And of course, you know, in Iran, they have morality police, as they do in Saudi Arabia and in other places. Um, ISIS has them. I read about ISIS uh, uh, morality police walking around with these sort of metal pinchers that tear at the flesh of women who, whose flesh is visible. Uh, so there's morality police, uh, like in Iran, for example. Uh, just recently, they hired another 7,000 morality police in Tehran alone because they can't control women. And no matter how much they try, exactly. You're not keeping us down. Uh, so, you know, this is a picture of it. I mean, it's constant harassment. People are stopped. They're told their, veil, their hair is showing. There are fines involved. There can be up to two months in prison. And, of course, there are vigilantes that throw acid in the faces of women who are not properly veiled and on and on and on. Now, this is a wonderful cartoon from Persepolis. I don't know if you've seen the book and the film uh, of Marjan Satrapi, and she, here she's, you know, you've got some of the police saying, yes, but when you run, your behind makes movements that are, how do you say, obscene. And she says, well, then don't look at my ass. <laughs> and she says, I yelled so loudly that they didn't even arrest me, you know, scared them off. It reminds me of the story I heard. Uh, I don't know if it was one of our friends or what, but uh, this woman was saying the morality police had stopped them, saying that their, her daughter's... Um, uh, legs were showing, and her daughter was like six years old. So she took her umbrella and started beating the guy and saying, stop looking at my daughter's legs. <laughs> and I guess that's a good offense. The best defense is offense, isn't it? So, um, so it isn't a lot of fuss over a piece of clothing, as we're often told. The veil and segregation that it enforces are merely the most public manifestations of what's considered women's place in society, policed at every turn. There's a wonderful Afghan-American writer, Nushin Arbabzadeh, who I've just become familiar with. Uh, she's done a wonderful piece on this where she says that the discussions around the veil here in the West are so sanitized, whereas the really sinister campaigns, the oppressive nature, are very often completely ignored. Here's a perfect example of it. It says, have you ever seen a, an onion uh, that has a worm in it? No because an onion has seven layers of the chador, but the, but the uh, potato has a very light clothing and is always in danger of being eaten by worms. And then at the end it says, so sisters, be an onion. Be an onion. Wow, fun, profound. And in Iran, as in many places, veiling is imposed on the backs of slogans like death to the unveiled women. And in Iran, one of the, their main slogans it was Yoru Sari Yotu Sari, which means you either wear the veil or you will be beaten. And this is a cartoon where, you know, there are Islamists in Iran saying women who aren't properly veiled should be raped. Now, don't forget the veil is compulsory in Iran. And they're still saying this. And this is a perfect example of others fighting for girls to be brought home against Boko Haram in Nigeria. And, you know, the Iranian government's officials are saying, rape the bad hijabi girls, teach them a lesson. And, of course, as you know, every calamity from earthquakes, you all remember boobquake, Jennifer McCright's boobquake, to rivers running dry are blamed on unveiled or improperly veiled women. And this is a wonderful cartoon from Mana. Uh, Nayastani. He shows, you know, the officials stealing money, going to Canada, um, throwing, uh, someone throwing acid in a woman's face, police beating someone who's got a banner saying freedom, executions, floggings, but here's a woman's hair and the river runs dry. It, it's typical, um, the sort of uh, attitude they have towards women. And even if in places where it isn't compulsory, including in the West, there is this immense pressure you know, so there's this idea, if you're veiled, uh, you go to heaven, otherwise you go straight to hell. I'll see you all there.
you know, the, the sort of, uh, you're immoral, you know, you're loose. In Turkey, I don't know if you heard recently about a woman um, who was um, beaten on the bus for wearing shorts. She's a nurse. And the guy was released. Though Erdogan held so many free thinkers in, in prison, none of them seemed to be able to get released. But this guy got released, and he said he just thought, you know, she was wearing improper clothing. Um, in Britain, uh, young women who are hijabis but aren't dressed in the way that the Islamists and the fundamentalists think appropriate are called hojabis. So there's this constant, constant pressure. Children are veiled. Children, for goodness sakes, and no one bats an eyelid. Oh yes, I forget. Hijab is a right and a choice, even if it's when it regards children. Specifically speaking, though, choice is a formality when there is little right or choice to remove one's veil or remain unveiled without being vilified. This is a perfect Jesus and Mo cartoon. Muhammad says, oh, stop complaining, Jesus. You should feel protected like a precious pearl within an oyster shell. And Jesus is like, I just feel hot. And Muhammad says, the important thing is to show the world that it's a liberating, empowering choice, a symbol of your freedom to express your identity. Then he says, can I take it off now? No. <laughs> and that's the thing, you can never take it off. But I think, most importantly, whose side are you on? Of course, there are women who choose and have a right not to have an abortion in Ireland. But you must side with the women who want one and cannot have one because of the states and the Catholic Church's control over women's bodies. But when it comes to us and the veil, it's the other way around. Many feminists, many liberals, those on the left, and I say that as someone firmly on the left, defend the right to be veiled, but never defend the right to be unveiled and to live to tell the tale. What a betrayal. We're told it's our culture, our religion. Leave us to it. Respect it. Well, I'm sorry. Many of us will not respect the violation of women's rights, no matter how it is packaged and dressed. Culture isn't homogeneous. <laughs> culture isn't homogeneous. Neither are communities or societies. Defending the group right to impose veiling and segregation defends the powerful. This sort of identity politics ignores and it negates dissent. It fails to see the social and political struggles and class politics. The result of all this, says Keenan Malik, the British writer, is that solidarity has become increasingly defined not in political terms, as collective actions in pursuit of certain political ideals, but in terms of ethnicity and culture. And that's exactly what the far right does as well. They homogenize culture, entire societies and communities, and immediately say that they're incompatible with Western society, so as to promote, if we're honest, what is fundamentally white politics, white identity politics. When it comes to culture, anyway, whose culture are we talking about? The woman and the man resisting the veil, or the theocrats who are imposing it? There is an immense unveiling movement in Iran, for example, even though it is compulsory and punishable by fines and imprisonment. This is a wonderful photo taken in Iran in front of a poster which says, Sisters, you must obey your Islamic hijab. And she's there without a veil. And even men are joining this movement with with messages saying that it's unfair that women should have to be covered up and that people should be free to dress as they choose. When you are faced with a state and a movement, the Islamist movement, that aims to erase you, erase you from the public space, your refusal to disappear is an important form of resistance and dissent. آیت الله العظما ناصر مکرم شیرازی مجرع تقلید شیعان جهان خیلی 
اسم بلند و دراز به معنی فتوای احمقانه و ایشون اومدن صحبت کردن در رابطه با چقدر فتنه های زیادی در جامعه هست و اینکه آدم صبح ایمان داره شب یه کافر میشه به این سادگی به این سادگی میره رو اینترنت سری حاضری این دقیقه باید تمام ایمان رو ایمان تو بفروشی من که خیلی وقت ایمانم رو فروختم ولی خب میگن که این خیلی جای نگرانیه و این که خب از هر زاویه میتونی به راحتی این ایمان تو از دست بدی واقعا خیلی جای نگرانیه آخر سالم چهارشنبه سوری بود خیلی نگران شده بودن گفته بودن که مردم میرن این کارهایی میکنن اونجا که اصلا ناراحت میشن و بعدش احساس میکنن که ایمانشون رو دست دادن اونا که احساس کار... میکنن ایشون مثل که احساس آره میکنن احساس میکنن که ایمانشون رو دست دادن یکی بهش میگه که خب آقا خب یه فتوا بدین در این مورد شما که ماشین تولید فتوا هستین یه فتوا بدین میگه نه دیگه کسی به فتواهای ما هم گوش نمیکنه ما ما از اول همینو گفتیم دیگه فتوا رو بذاریم برای خودتون بی خودن ربطی به زندگی مردم ندارن وقت ما رو تلف نکنین فهم. البته برای این برنامه من فقط خوبن فقط برای مسخره کردن فتوای احمقانتون رو برای خودتون نگه دارین کسی بهتون گوش نمی کنه خودتون هم میدونین بهناز شفیعی یک زن 27 ساله که واقعا بعد از چندین سال اعتراض و مقاومت تونسته اولین مسابقه موتور سواری زنان رو در ایران سازمان بده و چقدر واقعا صحنه‌ای زیبایی هست این موتور سواری ها دقیقا و چقدر چندین سال تلاش کرده این کار بکنه از کوچیکی عاشق موتور سواری بوده سوار موتور برادرش می شده و حتی لباس پسرانه می کرده تنش که بره بتونه موتور سواری کنه ولی با محدودیت هایی رو که حکومت اسلامی و اسلامیون در واقع سنگ کنم تو کوچه و محل و خیابون برای زنا به وجود بردن نتونستن جلوشو بگیرن و با تمام محدودیت ها رو پله به پله جنگیده و این لحظه زیبای زندگی رو درست کرده و این وضعیتی که خیلی ها توش هستن و روز و شب باش دارن و یه حرفای جالبی میزنه میگه که وقتی که به یه بچه میگی خب دست نزن به این آتیش نباید دست بزنی بچه میخواد بیشتر دست بزنه ببینه چرا اجازه نداره این کار بکنه و برای بهناز شفی هم همینطور بود بهش گفتن که میخواد. نکن ح... گفت که پس باید حتما انجام بده خود شما میتونی هست <تصفيق> نه واقعا جالبه این منو یاد اون روزایی که خیلی سالهای پیش دهه هشتاد که خیلی جوان بودم توی سودان زندگی میکردم برای دو سال و اونجا موتور سواری میکردم و یه بار افتادم و دیدم همه مردا اومدن دارن میدوان به طرف من خیلی خوشحال شدم گفتن اه چقدر خوب و مهربون اومدن کمکم کنن نگو که اومدن سرم داد بزنن که چرا یه زن داره موتور سواری میکنه و واقعا یاد اون موقع افتادم وقتی خبر بهناز رو شنیدم و واقعا خیلی خوشحال شدم داستان زندگی خیلی از زنان در جامعه ایران و کشورهای اسلامی ولی لحظات زیبا رو میشه دید و با این لحظه زیبا برنامه این هفتهمون رو به پایان میرسونیم امیدواریم که از برنامه این هفته خوش اومده باشه تو هفته آینده روزا و شبای خیلی خوبی داشته باشین تا بعد I'm Fari Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our 
year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.